Thunder Bay hosts a rally in support of missing and murdered Aboriginal women. Lead-footed drivers continue to cause concerns near a city school. And an official opening for a new health center. Good evening and thank you for joining us. A special ceremony in Thunder Bay today to honor a large number of victims. There are over 600 known cases of missing and murdered Aboriginal women in Canada and that number continues to grow. Several of those on that list are from northwestern Ontario. But October 4th has become a day that's set aside to honor these women and to also give support to those who have been left behind. Courtney Rutherford reports. The missing and murdered Aboriginal women are mothers, grandmothers, sisters, daughters and nieces. People who were ripped away and have gone without a trace, leaving their families wanting answers. For many years, Aboriginal families have tried to bring awareness to the tragedy by setting aside a day that draws attention of people across the country. I think it's been a long uphill battle to get the awareness and to get the momentum that we need. Uh, there's still a long way to go. I don't think that um, enough attention is paid to missing and murdered Aboriginal women. The fact that over 600 known cases um, have been reported and there's still... Um, a delay or a denial um, for a national inquiry into that is definitely speaks volumes. So I think we're, we're making progress um, and we're, we're doing all that we can, but there's a long way to go. The Ontario Native Women's Association hosted the Sisters in Spirit Vigil to offer a place for families affected to gain support from each other. Ending violence against Aboriginal women is a top priority for ANWA and they plan on doing whatever it takes to gain as much support as possible. I come from a small community and um, there was a number of women from, I was raised in McDermott and growing up I had heard of um, many women that had been missing and later found murdered, so, um, as well as um, family members. And so I come out because I think it's an important issue, it's a human rights issue. The Native Women's Association of Canada has launched a petition calling for a national inquiry into the missing and murdered women. The petition can be found at www.anwa.ca. Courtney Rutherford, TBT News. There's a new development today related to this week's fatal hit and run on Algoma Street. 38-year-old bicyclist Richard Vrastak died from injuries he suffered when hit by a minivan. At the time, police said he'd been intentionally targeted this was followed by word yesterday that 32-year-old Sheldon Yesno of Thunder Bay had been arrested and charged with second-degree murder in what police say was a drug-related attack. Now the Nishinaabe Aski Nation has issued a statement on the case. It confirms that Yesno is the son of Grand Chief Harvey Yesno. Nan has expressed its condolences to the family of the victim and its continued support for Grand Chief Yesno and his family. It also says because of the personal nature of the incident, NAN officials will be making no further comment on the case. People are continuing to speed down Dawson Road despite measures taken to get motorists to slow down. Now a report on the issue will go to City Council on Monday night. Time and time again, residents in the area and the ward councillor have tried to find ways to address the safety concern. Earlier proposals to lower the speed limit were shot down by council, but radar speed signs installed late last year seem to be having some impact. The signs and the community safety zone were initiated in November of last year near Five Mile School. Thunder Bay Police have also been busy issuing speeding tickets. They've already doubled the number issued last year, and even though people continue to speed on Dawson Road, the city's traffic technologist feels the radars are having a positive impact. When the signs aren't active, we're seeing some speeds, uh, yeah, operating speed about 85 mile, uh, kilometers an hour. Uh, when they are activated, the operating speed is roughly 75 to 78 kilometers an hour. Uh, the speed limit here is 70 kilometers an hour. Love says having the speed displayed right in front of you can be a shock and make a driver slow down. The city will review the effect of the radars in another two years. Meanwhile, they're hoping police will step up enforcement in the area as well. The head of the Thunder Bay Children's Centre says there will continue to be a need for youth treatment beds in the city, even though the program is now closed. The six-bed residential care program operated for roughly 15 years, but shut down October 1st. About 100 youth with complex needs utilized the program over that time, and Tom Walters says there were many successes. 
Walters adds the program assisted in keeping some youth in school, out of hospital and out of the young offenders system. City Council is sending a letter of support for the program to the province. Walters says the funding just wasn't there anymore to keep the program running. We will see some youth go to southern Ontario. We may see some youth get um, into other systems, get into more trouble. Some of them may end up in the young offender system because there's not the kind of supports that they want and they may end up getting care that way. Some will certainly be disruptive in school. Walters notes it was a tough decision to close down the residential care program. Three of the four young people who were staying in the housing at the time will move to foster homes. The other has been sent to southern Ontario. A single vehicle accident on Maple Ward Road has left the driver with minor injuries. Police say it happened around 8.45 this morning when the car left the roadway and ended up on its roof in a ditch. The 51-year-old driver was able to get out of the vehicle without assistance and was treated in hospital and released. She's been charged with careless driving. Highway repaving west of Atacokan should start this fall. Now that the government has awarded a contract for the work, it'll cover a 20-kilometer section of Highway 11 at a cost of $6.7 million. Pioneer Construction says it expects to create about 70 jobs in the process. There's a new building on the city's south side that's welcoming all people to learn, heal, and accept one another. The Blue Sky Community Healing Centre held its grand opening today. Located on Victoria Avenue East, it will house small businesses dedicated to people's well-being. Cindy Crow is the lodge keeper of the Grey Wolf Traditional Teaching Lodge, and it's been her dream that's made the centre a reality. She says the main goal is to promote unity in the community. All Aboriginal and non-Aboriginals are welcome to take part in things like sharing in wisdom circles, movie nights, and open mic events. Crow says the centre has been eight years in the making, so it's an emotional time for her and it's about providing options. People that are staying at the shelter house or John Howard or other places and they may not have other options, other things to do and we're hoping that this centre provides them that option. We're very welcoming, um, we promote simple things like love, kindness, caring and sharing, that's what we're all about. I think it's going to make a contribution to uh, rebuilding this part of the community. The fact that uh, this, this building is going to uh, host a number of small businesses is a positive thing for the area and I'm hoping that uh, they all succeed and they all make their contribution to the community. Events at the Centre have already been taking place for a few weeks. For a full list of programming, you can visit the Centre's website. Some injured workers are hoping their stories can help change the province's workers' compensation laws. A handful of people took part in a meeting this afternoon hosted by Thunder Bay's Injured Workers Group. There, they spoke about their experiences dealing with the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, and few, if any of them, had anything nice to say. Though each presented their case in a different way, the message from nearly all of these injured workers was consistent. WSIB wears you out and breaks you down. Robert Story is the Director of Labour Studies at McMaster University. He's a member of a group trying to change Ontario's worker compensation laws to make it easier for injured employees to get the compensation they deserve. That's why he's travelling around the province, holding these types of meetings, listening to the struggles of those injured on the job, much like Justice William Meredith did exactly a hundred years ago, when the original workers' compensation laws were drafted. The system was meant to be one that secured fair compensation for all injured employees for as long as they needed it. That, he says, is a far cry from the one in place today. When you go from hurt to harm, you go from you know, physical injury to emotional and psychological injury because the system, it just wears you down. So that's not what Meredith wanted, but that's what we're finding across the province. And it, it's just, it's where people just giving up on it because they, 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 they just can't deal with a system that was supposed to be fair, that was supposed to be justice, and that was supposed to deliver guaranteed and secure compensation. Ed Sepineri injured his back nearly 50 years ago while working as a mechanic. He says at first WSIB paid for a back brace for him, but when it came time to replace it... They refused it. They refused a thing that cost $125. So there you go. It goes to show you what, what they, they honour it, then they say, oh yeah, you're not disabled. 
These are the types of tales that Story and his crew will include in a report to be presented at the International Workers' Compensation Conference in Toronto later this month. We'll give our interim report there, we'll get feedback, then we'll write a final report which we'll put absolutely everywhere and anywhere we can. Anybody who wants to listen, we'll talk about it, we'll put it to the decision makers, we'll put it to injured workers groups, uh, we'll put it on the web and we'll talk about it with anybody who wants to listen to us because we think that you know at that point we'll have the force of this collective voice behind us to uh, talk about the issues and hopefully to force some reform. That would be music to the ears of Sepineri. I mean, an injured worker is an injured worker. I mean, if he pays his dues and that, he should be looked after. And Thunder Bay's injured workers group will hold another such meeting tonight at 7 o'clock. A class action lawsuit against Bell Mobility has been certified in an Ontario court. The suit alleges that expiry dates shouldn't be allowed on Bell's prepaid wireless services and that they should be treated more like gift cards. The suit was filed on behalf of anyone in Ontario who purchased prepaid wireless services since May 2010 from Bell Mobility, Virgin Mobile or Solo Mobile, all of which are brands of Bell Canada. Bell has said the case is without merit and it plans to defend against it. Use of technology in classrooms these days isn't something teachers shy away from. In fact, they're embracing it. That topic was up for discussion at today's Literacy Development Workshop held at the Valhalla Inn. Carol Volbrack is the Literacy Coordinator with the Northern Ontario Education Leaders. She says the program offered today was specifically designed for teachers, principals, superintendents and directors. Those that came together discussed how to lead a connected school and how the use of technology inside the classroom can actually support student achievement. Volbrack adds their schools have come a long way in the past couple of years. Into a classroom these days would be surprised because the blackboard has frequently been replaced by a smart board and we'll see many, many students with their own devices and uh, iPads in the hands of all of the students and so forth. But in actual fact, those are tools that are made available. And like any tool, you need to be able to use them in a, an effective manner. The workshop is a three-day event and is held annually in Thunder Bay. Thunder Bay's KBM Resources Group is celebrating today. It received the export honours at last night's Northern Ontario Business Awards in North Bay. After the downturn in the forest in industry, the consulting firm reinvented itself and used its expertise in forest management, aerial photography and map making to make a successful transition to take advantage of mining and energy business opportunities both here and in the U.S. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and staff at the Regional Health Sciences Centre are doing their part to make everyone aware of it. These hospital employees were easy to spot today in their bright pink apparel. Pink, of course, is the international colour to promote breast cancer awareness. Screening and Assessment Services Manager Tarja Haskinen says Thunder Bay is ahead of the provincial curve when it comes to the percentage of women screened. Still, she'd like to see the number soar even higher. We're better than uh, the provincial average. Uh, provincially, about, six, about 50, 60 percent are getting screened uh, in the age group that we target, which is 50 to 74. And uh, in the northwest, we're sitting around 70 percent. So we are doing not too bad. But as I said, there's always room for improvement. Haskinen is particularly concerned about women just entering that high-risk age range. She says there's been a decline in the number of 50-year-old women getting screened for breast cancer.